Welcome back, everybody, to the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are the podcast for Star Wars News Net. I'm John. Thank you for joining us on this wonderful 8822. That's probably a, like a, sounds like a droid, 8822. Hmm. But joining me are two non droids, James Vaney and Lacey Giller. She's back. Where are we? <laughs> back. She's back, baby. Mm-hmm. Lacey is back. Lacey, how you doing? I'm doing okay. Thank you, everyone, for your nice messages and well wishes. Uh, COVID is no joke. Don't get it. Zero out of ten. Would not recommend. Mm. Yelp. Good Good to have you back. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. James, what? uh, It's cut off. I can't see it. What shirt are you wearing? What's going on? Oh, the. Um, visions one. Visions. Yeah. Nice. I'm wearing an outdated TRB logo. I have a shirt with that logo, and it's honestly my favorite shirt. It's so comfy. It's like worn in. The old logo? Like yeah. 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 Quality. Um. So here's the deal. We are back on our normal Monday show, all three of us together again, and we have some news to talk about. Um. But just real quick, I wanted to ask you guys, uh, when you heard that Andor was moving to 921, were you like, good, because summer's nuts? Or were you like, oh, man, where, what was your first reaction when you heard that news? James, how about you? Um. Yeah, bummed at first. I mean, that's almost an entire month that it was pushed back. But previous to hearing the announcement, I put out something that was like, why the heck is Game of Thrones and Marvel and Lord of the Rings, and Star Wars, all releasing properties within, like, 10 days of each other. And everybody uh, was, like, retweeting it like crazy because they're like, I know, it's, like, kind of ridiculous that it all landed that way. Uh, So, to me, when they announced the move, it just seemed like they were buffering for that. Like, let the season premieres get their justice. Let Let everybody be on, like, episode two or so before we drop our big, big bomb. Yeah, that's fair. Lacey, how about you? Were you okay with it, or did it bum you out? No, I I was okay with it. It actually didn't bother me at all. I was just like, oh, okay. Like, because I feel like at this point, Disney's done it with so many different shows. They did it with Kenobi. They did it with Loki. Now they did it with Andor. I'm sure they've done it with other stuff. Um, I do like the whole pushing it back to get three episodes thing. I'm all for that because, um, you know, being greedy, being a greedy Star Wars fan, like I'd always want more, especially because they always cut the episodes at the perfect time. Um, the only downside is that we obviously do a review show on those episodes, so it's going to be a, a mad dash to watch them before they get spoiled for me. Um, yeah. Because people like to immediately post screenshots of <laughs> the episodes like 30 minutes after it's happened. Mm-hmm. and. Are people? How are people screenshotting Disney Plus? I thought it. I don't know because you definitely mm-hmm. can't. So they're yeah. running it through some type of yeah, you, virtual you, desktop or yeah, you can torrent, always BitTorrent. Yeah, you can so you can get away. screenshots from stuff. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, uh, Mad Dash to watch things. Just so everybody knows we are planning on doing an episode about Light and Magic. Um, I haven't watched it. It's totally my it. fault, guys. <laughs> it's totally. I don't think my James fault. has watched it either. I've watched uh, about half of it. Wait, th- I was going to be honest. Like, I've had COVID. I haven't been able to do anything. Like, literally, you don't want to do anything. Mm-hmm. So, I haven't watched it yet. And that's why. Yeah, we'll get around to it, though. So, just uh, in case mm-hmm. everyone who was wondering, we will be talking all about that on an upcoming episode. But today, we're mm-hmm. here to give our takes on the latest news going on in Star Wars. So, James, take it away. <laughs> It's the resistance. Resistance report this week has got to start with the thing that we didn't really talk about on last Monday's episode because we recorded it before it came out. But uh, we're, the Andor trailer did drop, and now everybody is talking about the visuals and how the show looks and everything like that. Um, how it seems maybe a little bit more film esque versus this like digital or television look, if you will. And uh, it was 
brought to the attention of everybody that uh, it's going to be the first um, show, Star-, Star Wars series, that's not using the volume LED stage and that all of the sets in the show are practical. Uh, this coming from Tony Gilroy in an Empire article um, about, you know, just his his understanding and why they did it that way. And it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, I'm going to kick it off with Lacey on this one. Um, what are your thoughts on and or all sets practical so says tony gilroy um i'm obsessed with the fact that it's not in the uh volume and that's coming from someone that was totally like this is the coolest thing when the whole volume was shown to us and they talked about it and what they were able to do for the mandalorian i think especially the space scenes it's really shined with like the space ships within the volume has really added to the movies but even then they're sitting in a spaceship, so there is a practical aspect of it. There's just something so sweepingly beautiful and cinematic about these landscapes in this trailer, um, and I missed it. I missed seeing these really great moments in Star Wars where you, they're tangible places that you could visit. There's something so cool about that that like that is a place that exists that you can go see um and it as someone that's not just a star wars fan but a fan of movies there's nothing i geek out more than being like oh my god they shot that here or oh my god they shot that over there or that and something like that um i loved hearing diego luna luna talk about it where he said that they like hiked up a mountain (laughs) to get Mm -hmm. a shot and it reminds me a lot of like what they've done with the other Star Wars movies where they shot outside of a hotel room because it was nice and snowy and they went to the Redwood Forest because it looked very otherworldly. There's just, it's just so cool. And you, no matter how awesome digital is, and I don't want to take away from the skill and um, just creative control that they have there, especially with like the golden hour, magic hour shoots and how they can get that perfect timing like they did with the Batman. Um, it it's just different. It's just different when you can see these beautiful lush landscapes or these sets that they are interacting with. Because we even saw that with Kenobi where there were moments where you could tell that they weren't in a physical set. Like they were standing in front of, front of a big screen and it kind of flattens it. It makes it less dynamic. This, it's like you're seeing them on the mountain. You're seeing the rocks and the grass and the sky and like the just sweeping like vastness of this planet. Um, And I'm just all for it. I I love it. I can't wait to see where else they go. I can't wait to see all these new planets we're going to learn about because they're not sandy. And I (laughs) I just am so excited that there's no sand. Yeah, that's a good point. John, it was... um kind of interesting you know the universe was sort of speaking on last uh as we recorded last episode that we've done the thursday episode because we were talking about fans missing out on the theatrical experience you know and we're so used to how dare you guys talk without me (laughs) yeah thought we were were a team (laughs) we are a team you ditched no i'm just kidding (laughs) (laughs) um (laughs) but no it was was about that argument like a little bit about what does it mean uh that the volume Mm -hmm. is sort of taking precedent now in disney television so what are your thoughts after reading uh this point of view and and now seeing the trailer for andor i just i am consistently happy with how forthright and candid Tony Gilroy is and how he speaks with such conviction without fear of backlash. He's just like, this is how I feel. This is what we did. Deal with it. I and think I, John is like the super Tony Gilroy fan. You know what? I, I think you're right. Star I've Wars never needs. heard anyone talk about Tony Gilroy as much and as passionately as John does. He's I like John's think... new Lawrence Kasdan. Like he's <laughs> it... the next generation. Of John's if the two fandom. of them got together to make a Star Wars, it'd probably be the greatest thing to ever happen to the brand. <laughs> but I think they need more people who don't care about Star Wars to make Star Wars, and that's who this guy is. He just like I will tell, I will tell so the story. Taika. You will watch the story, and you will like it. 
And it's just like, yeah. he's like, they, they're like, give us a tease at the, at the panel. He's like, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to do that. This is what we're going to do. Here's the deal. He's like a commander. I like it. When I see this guy talking about this stuff, especially for a studio that's been constantly having problems with this person fired and this person's movie's getting pushed aside and this project's not happening and we're waiting on this actor to do this. This guy's like, this is happening. I'm the guy. Here's the deal. And I, I like that. There's a lot of confidence in what he's doing. And I think that that filters down to the rest of the production. We, have, we didn't really hear any problems about this series once he came in. It's just like, that's why when people are like, people are sleeping on Andrew. I'm like, no, because no one's talking about it because it's, there's no problems. There's like the, the me- news media, like whether it's sports or anything, it's typically, you know, sports radio and stuff. It's more engaging to talk about how, things that aren't going right. If things are going great, you're like, things are great. We don't have much else to say. Mm-hmm. If things are bad, you're like, this is how they got to fix this. This is how, what they have to do here. The fact that this was a pretty smooth, as far as we understand, production over in the UK, you didn't hear much issues, no delays or anything. There wasn't much to talk about it. So I don't think that it was fans sleeping on it. I think it was just like, they're making it and here it comes. And now here he is up front saying, we didn't use stagecraft. We're old school. And I saw a couple things that bothered me online. I saw some like VFX people take umbrage with that. And I don't really understand why, because he didn't pull one of those like, there's no visual digital effects here or anything like that. He just said a fact. He said, we did not use stagecraft. That is a fact. You cannot get mad at a fact. That is what happened. You can pretend you don't like it or whatever. He's just telling the truth. I and, mean, look at The Force Awakens. J.J. made it a big thing to use practical. Right. and But he didn't say it's, Again, it's not one of those things where it's like there was a shot in uh, Stranger Things recently and, and the Stranger Things account said, like, this was all practical. There was no visual effects and people got really mad at it. Because I think that's there were. what people were coming off of, to be honest. And visual effects ar- artists in general don't get treated very well. Right. But you can, I, I understand that. But if you are in that industry, you also more than anyone, I think, need to understand intricacies and nuance and that sort of thing. And I don't think he said anything wrong. He just said, we didn't use that technology. We're old school. Old school doesn't mean no digital effects anymore. The prequels are old school. And if you remember the sizzle reel from late 2020, when they first showed us like the filming of Andor, it looked like the sets from The Phantom Menace because you had these giant big corridors massive hallways these uh, city center set pieces but also like green screen or blue screens and stuff it really looked like that documentary from the phantom menace so that's old school now and that's kind of what he's saying he's like yeah we're using effects he's not saying we're not he all he's saying is i didn't we're not using the sagecraft and i think that is an interesting thing to say because of james what you and i were kind of talking about like as good and Lacey, you brought up on at the top of the episode. As great as Kenobi wasn't, how much I loved it, you did kind of feel that it was. They were in a in room. A, in a room, and yeah. it was driving the story that they were in a room. And it was yeah, it's supposed to be an intimate story, so they they were able to get away with that. So I'm not here to say like oh, Deborah Chow, you know, made these choices or whatever. Oh, neither I also am think- I. I'm just saying that it just seemed like the sets and the story made it so kind of close because yeah. that's what they were working with. Yeah. And and that's fine. You know, I have no problem with that. I, I really enjoyed Kenobi. I, I have a feeling if we got a chance to look at the budgets, we'd be sur- probably not surprised by Kenobi having a lower budget than a lot of these other shows that are coming out, not even just Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Um, but man, yeah, Tony Gilroy, I'll say it. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the guy. Uh, I loved what he obviously did for Rogue One. He saved that movie from being something that could have been a complete disaster. Where is it's Gareth movie... Edwards? Is he all right? All right. Is he's he okay? Hey, you play ball and you're the guy who directed Rogue One. Go float in that pool noodle, man. Like that video of him just like chilling. Do it, Gareth. Yeah. You earned it. <laughs> but I'm just saying that that movie's always trending. Out of all the Star Wars movies, it's always Rogue One trending. I'd let this guy do whatever he wants to do because he seems to have gotten it right. And we haven't seen Andor yet. Maybe it's not as good as we're expecting it to be. It just seems like he is fully confident in his process and what he's doing. And I really think that's that's been a rare thing with these Star Wars projects 
to the point where we're like, oh yeah, we forgot, you know, forgot about Andor. Why? Because there's been no problems, and that's a good thing. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know what more I could add that we, you know, one kind of didn't talk about on Thursday uh, about this particular thing. I think that, you know, when, to me, a little bit, slightly argumentative, I do understand kind of the stance of when he says, we're not using stagecraft, we're old school. It gives a little bit of a vibe of like, I don't know, it's better this way or something like that. Like, Oh, I don't do digital. I I only use real film or something like that. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of like a little bit of a shot, but I I I don't know. I don't think that's so much what's going on here, but I I do think there's probably he probably James, had the opportunity quick. to use this and chose not to because he's like, "Nah." But even if it is a shot, who cares? What if this show winds up looking better and being better? Then he's right. No, 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 no. I, I get that. You know, I get yeah. that. I'm saying I could kind of understand somebody being like upset that you're like downing new technology or something. But I just think we've gotten to a point where people are taking preferences as insult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And it's not, you know, it's like me being like, I like peanut butter and strawberry jelly. And John goes, I like peanut butter and grape jelly. And I'm like, uh, excuse me, are you against sandwiches? Like, right, right. It's like, no, yeah, I'm not. That, that, that's <laughs> exactly, like that's jelly. the internet. That's the internet. And this guy is having <laughs> yeah. none of it. He's like, I'm 65. I don't care what people on Twitter are saying. I'm making this show and it's going to be awesome. And you're going to enjoy it. Period. I love it. I love this guy. Well, I want to hang out with this guy. Speaking of his show, um, a lot of the actors have been doing the rounds talking about uh, the show coming up and uh, Empire, again, you know, covering all of this. I got to speak with a lot of the different uh, actors in the show, uh, including Diego Luna, um, even even Tony Gilroy himself, you know. Um, but uh, probably most notably here, Fiona Shaw um, having a lot of things to say about how Tony has crafted the story uh, and kind of relating it to real world experiences that, you know, she believes are going on right now and how it, it show is really uh, showcasing how the Empire is sort of taking over. And it feels like the same thing is happening in reality as well. Um, John, I'll let you talk about this one first. What are your thoughts on uh, some of the comments from the cast coming out about Andor? This uh, is, should be no surprise to anybody. Um, if you listen to even recent interviews with George Lucas, when he spoke with James Cameron about, I think it was about special effects, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, it was from a couple of years ago and they were talking about, um, what inspired him to write the story of star Wars. And back then it was political environment too. Like in the seventies, things were a nightmare in the United States. And that was part of the reason why Star Wars was so successful. It was this like escape and a hopeful story. And it really was something people needed at the time. Gas prices through the roof. You could only get gas on, depending on what letter your street started with. Interest rates, 18%. Just like everyone having a really difficult time. And this movie comes out, charming, family friendly, takes you to another galaxy, and it ends with the good guys winning. And it's just like, he 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 modeled that based on you know the Vietnam War and you know who were who were the good guys who were the bad guys were we the Imperials you know that sort of thing Nixonian politics so this stuff's always been there he wrote it with that stuff in mind so I find it interesting today people revise history and say like oh they've got they've they're interjecting politics into into writing Star Wars and it's just like that's not true that is false because George Lucas himself is on record saying you know. I was inspired creating the rebels based on this and the empire based on this and, and American imperialism and going over, you know, invading Vietnam and stuff. And, and what was going on with the Nixon administration, all those things. He, it's, it's all there for you to find out. So um, it's right on par with everything that has, uh, that was the Genesis of star Wars. Obviously it's a fantasy uh, soap opera and a fictional story, but you know, art is always inspired by life. So uh, I, I, didn't find this to be surprising one bit whatsoever. I, I, and I think it's interesting that uh, that they're still going that way, especially when it's Disney, who we have seen try to shy away from that deep end of the pool, so to speak, 
Um, and again, you know, it's Tony Gilroy saying, this is the story I, you know, I want to tell here. And uh, I think it's, it's right on point because I think this is going to, you know, get a lot of people fist pump and saying like, yes, yes, go, go Cassian, do that, defeat them, beat them. And it's like, that's the, that, that story of Star Wars. That's Luke flying down the trench to go defeat the Death Star. That's, that's what we're going to be rooting for here. Uh, except we're seeing the, the formation of said alliance. So I, I, I think that's right on point with how this franchise has always been. Mm -hmm. They see thoughts on any of these comments? Um, I think, you know, obviously the big takeaway that was running rampant all over the places that she said that it's the take on a Trumpian world. I think that's probably the, the trigger for a lot of people, which is understandable. That being said, I completely agree with John. I, Star Wars is called Star Wars. I don't know, understand how people could not see the connections between you know politics and star wars and obviously wars and and the trials and tribulations of dealing with that i mean movies that i love like hunger games is literally the same exact thing so people use the medium of film and tv and books and everything else to take apart their understanding and feeling feelings about their real life so it's no surprise that when things are the way they are right now and things are crazy all over the world not just here in america that they'll then translate within the stories that are being told on screen like this one which is literally a war story mm -hmm. um it is interesting to hear them talk about just like the process of like how kind of involved it, it seems like the actors are with Tony Gilroy and how he kind of walks them through and he's been very hands-on with where the story is going and how those connections are being made between the world we're seeing today and the world we're going to see in this galaxy far far away so um we said this off air but I think we said this off air I can't remember but uh I am not looking forward to being depressed because it sounds like this show is going to be <laughs> super depressing. Um, which, I mean, Rogue One isn't like a, the happiest of movies, but um, we've talked about it before. I think in this show, Andor and the Rebels have to lose a lot. They have to not succeed if they want to have that big payoff with Rogue One where they do succeed. Um, yeah, it's going to be rough. <laughs> it's going to be rough. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not a political person at all, but like when I hear these comments and how they're sort of like reflecting today's society and stuff, like the first thing I thought about immediately is, well, it's not really going to be that evident, I don't think. Um, because, I mean, you take a movie, like just for instance, this is kind of off the top of my head a little bit, but like 1984, like uh, Wonder Woman, like Pedro Pascal's character sort of like model Donald Trumpish, you know what I mean? Like this uh, sort of. I still haven't seen that. Yeah, I don't know. Like the way, like some movies, for instance, they make it sort of clear, like they're almost handing it to you. Like this is supposed to be this person and mm -hmm. stuff. And Star Wars is never going to do that. There, there obviously is not a person in this that's going to look or act like um you know any political leader or something like that i agree i i definitely don't think that but so, i think there are going to be undertones of things that we're probably dealing with so when you take like a movie yeah. that's kind of intentionally vague about like a specific metaphorical idea or an artistic stance sometimes there's author intent but there's also going to be like how users view it some are going to say no this is what he's trying to say and others are like no the director was trying to say x you know, and it it's they're going to contradict and it's sort of how we take it. I think more or less this is almost true of the reverse of this is that this is a timeless tale about war and the world and the effects of like, you know, um, what happens when these people start pulling all of the resources and leaving nothing for the, the others, you know, the majority of people or something like that. And actors... Uh, like Fiona Shaw here can say, 
it's so great to have stories like that because you can relate them to things that are happening in the real world. It's not like this story was written about what's going on today. It's that this timeless tale of of war and life yeah. is also reflective in today's society because it always will be reflective in today's society. Like it's not about today's president or, you know, w- what's happening in the current state of political affairs, whatever. Um, it's just more like this, this is life. And these are stories that we've always dealt with when it comes to like people fighting each other, you know, and this is just what it comes down to. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I found it, uh, interesting. I think she's right. Uh, maybe even backwards and still right. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, kind of whatever. Um, but yes, very excited for Andor. Uh, I always get to say that. Uh, another thing here that I'm excited for is more evidence that Cameron Monaghan might be playing live action Cal Kestis. Um, the rumors are coming from an interview where he was asked specifically about would he be, you know, interested or what are the possibility of a of a live action appearance of Cal? And he said, well, of course, there's interest, but that's all I can say about that. That's about all I can say, you know. So it appears he's kind of leaning in that direction. And. You know, when you line that up with the story that we had a couple weeks ago when Christian Harloff was saying, you know, I'm not a scoop guy, but I know <laughs> that he's been tapped. He's playing this character. Um, it's happening kind of thing. Uh, it just kind of is interesting. So I- I'm going to jump to Lacey first on this I was going to ask you to start, James, because I know that you always talk about how great this video game was. <clears throat> you know, I... I got a friend like um, who just now told me, you know, I'm going to start this game, and he really liked it, and uh, he played Is through it. Is it me? No. <laughs> no, no, he played yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, he played it, yeah. Um, he said he really liked it, and he, now he's really interested in the in the second game, and he brought up some stuff about, I hope they don't, like, strip him of his powers somehow, because you have to go through a tutorial in the second game. It's like, that wouldn't make much sense. But uh, it was funny because we we were allowed to have the conversation about like how it connects with Kenobi and all this other stuff. And I'm like, yeah, apparently the second game is around that same timeline. A lot of this stuff seems like if they, you know, were keeping Reva alive or if they're going to do a second season of Kenobi, like it almost seems to me like there's a, a script or an idea that he would be involved if they did a second season of Kenobi, but it's still waiting to get greenlit. And if it does, then all of this smoke catches fire uh, because we're, we're not for sure that it's happening, but if it, but if that character is involved and they move forward with those scripts, he would obviously be the one to play it. I think is where the, the he's been tapped to play the character sort of thing is coming. Harloff say it was his own series though. Yeah, he did. Is that was that part of it? I thought it was just that Calcas is coming to live action and and he he's playing him. But we, I mean, we can look into it more. But again, mm-hmm. that's one of those things where, like, I don't know, like his source could still be sort of confused on like the oh yeah. Would you that's want happening. that, James? Would you? Would want I want him the Calcastus series on its yeah. own? Mm-hmm. Um. And he did say that. He said it would be his own series. He did say it would be his own series. So I don't know. Maybe not. Um, my my thoughts on the thing is that he is living a really good story in that world. Um, I would almost rather, instead of him moving up to live action, I would almost rather incorporate him into something else. Let him cross over and let him exist, sort of like Ahsoka is doing. Now, I know Ahsoka is getting her own series, too. But my point is, like, I well, I think it's really good that you already have, a, if you have a pre-existing property, you're like, I want to tell the story about this character, the Mandalorian. We don't know who he is, but we'll incorporate the other characters and back him up and bring them in and support him through that, rather than saying, you get a show, you get a show, you get a show. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So then, do you want to go now, Lacey, or do you want to hear John's thoughts? Um, I mean, my thoughts are I like Cameron Monaghan and I think that he's really excited to be a part of Star Wars and 
um, seeing him interact with stuff at the premiere and knowing he's still shooting like lightsaber videos in his backyard with a broom. I feel like give the guy a show. <laughs> he wants it. <laughs> Just give it to him. He's a good actor. Yeah, John. That's my thought. Yeah, are you feeling the same way? Like and now that I'm even thinking a little bit more about like what I said there, I, I'm I'm gonna double down because I think that if they bring him into say say my theory is it's probably wrong, but say it was right, they're doing a second season in Kenobi. He comes in, he's gonna have his few scenes and he's gonna shine, and everybody's gonna cheer him on, and the fans are gonna say like, yes, he's so great, oh, he's awesome, and it's gonna be cool. But if they give him his own series, there's probably gonna be this negative fan thing of like. We nobody was asking for this, you know, and they're going to ruin the game. And like the show was OK, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Like after six episodes, it was fine. It wasn't the best thing I've seen. You know, it's mm-hmm. like I just want him to I want the character to excel and make people interested in the games. I think the better way when to is, do that is just have when it's fall in order shine. Um, The second game, uh, I don't know that we did we get a release date for it. Well, Jedi Survivor is the title of the second oh, game, but Fall in Order t- takes place like where in relation yeah, to the Yeah, I'm movie. so Oh, bad that's with what you're lines. asking when does the canon timeline take place? Yeah. Um it takes place about like, I want right to say Kenobi? five to seven, maybe even ten years after Revenge of the Sith. So it, right. it I, w- I want to say it's a little bit before then, because I think the new game is taking place during around the 10 year Kenobi around arc. Kenobi then it's I think so it's mm. in the Kenobi ballpark we're looking at th- maybe three to five years sure um and he's you know three to five years older than when he probably filmed for that game so um I the I am all about this because you know I, like I've said many times I you know I think he's a very good actor and I think people will be surprised when he gets a chance to actually play a role and not just do the video game version if they haven't had a chance to see him in other stuff um like i know a lot of people liked him in gotham as that pseudo joker kind of guy but uh, you know on shameless he was excellent um the only problem i have with this and i know it's something we're continually having to deal with is just like that odd juxtaposition when it's positioned up against the original trilogy and it was like so special that obi-wan was like the last jedi surviving and like luke would be the last jedi um once yoda dies and you know that those scenes mean a lot like yoda telling luke like when i'm gone the guy the master the one who trained everybody when i'm gone the last of the jedi will you be that's so much pressure to put on luke and now like we keep adding these new characters into that timeline and it's either where did they go what happened to them did they die did they quit like did they not want a part of this galactic civil war how come yoda doesn't know about any of them it it just makes it a bit messy which makes me yearn for the let's go past episode nine and give someone a blank canvas because then you know yoda could be shut off like luke is I know, trilogy. but I don't want. I don't know that I I'm want just saying that's to be what the explanation off. could be: is that he shut himself off until Luke shows but, up, and then he I, I know, obviously feels but Luke, but he doesn't a, feel anybody else. Yeah, but but isn't it a little a little frustrating to be like we have to come up with these reasons now? You know, so I mean, but a tricky. lot of that comes down to the, George's own fault in, in some regard of like setting the prequels so close like 20 years before whereas it seemed like when obi-wan was describing it uh, you know a long time ago it was before Kenobi. way 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 long ago and yeah, it's kind of been trickling intended, down at this point he also it's to me it seemed like lucas's idea what in revenge of the sith was like they all got wiped out and what you see on screen is what's left so I, and I'm not saying like I don't like Rebels. I I I really like Rebels a lot. Clone Wars, you know. Uh, but I really really like Rebels a lot. So I don't want to like get rid of Ezra. I don't want to get rid of Kanan. I understand that. I'm just saying. And again, this is like the whole thing about nuance that I really like. Wish more people under mm-hmm. like got on board with was that you can love those things and still be like, man, that kind of makes this a little tougher though to explain like that 
scene in Return of the Jedi to my son. I'd be like, wait a minute, but if all those Jedi around, you know? So, but at the same time, I'm excited about it. So it, it's just, I, I think they need to just not do too much more of this or it's going to get a little too nutty. Um, but if they are going to give it to someone, I, I, I would be totally supportive of Cameron Monaghan getting in the mix. So I, I think it'd be kind of cool if it, if it winds up being true. And, and if so, then, uh, you are a scooper, Christian Harlow. Yeah. So there you the go. best <laughs> way to resolve these types of things is to make another, and I know it's an impossible task, but make another big franchise that everybody's looking forward to do, you know, 10, 11 and 12 or do a thousand years before any of this stuff. Oh yeah. Whatever it is. Yeah. Like if you yeah. can create that era, then you can spend more time over there. Like the fact that we even have, we have four, five, and six, but now we have one, two, and three, and seven, eight, and nine, and we're kind of skipping around in those eras. Um, it if we didn't have the bookends to four, five, and six, we'd just be revisiting Luke Sky, Luke Han, and Leia stories over and over and over and over yeah. and over again yeah. until it like really saturated itself. At least now, like they can take a break from that to do these or these or these and, and i would take it, all the luke Han and leia stories over and over and over and over again maybe <laughs> <laughs> but you i believe me we've already run into that we've already had the discussion of how many things can happen in three years mm -hmm. you know how many crazy adventures can you go on uh, it feels like literally every day you guys are fighting like a doomsday device <laughs> well something. that's the crazy thing and then yeah. if you look at the sequel trilogy is like oh it's a year and then between you know, TFA and Last Jedi, it's not even that. And yeah. you're like, there is no space here to tell yeah. anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Crazy. Um, one other thing we wanted to mention uh, about this week is, and, and John mentioned it kind of at the top, that, you know, we haven't really had a time to fully take in Light Magic yet since they dropped a six-hour movie practically on us. I mean, um, I did, but... Yeah. But, well, you got it early. You got it early, Jared. Yeah. And and you had a like a, a to do list like I have to watch this before X date because Look, if Lawrence Kazan texts me and says Hey you want to check this out I'm not gonna say no <laughs> he goes Larry <laughs> my friend why not he's in my phone as Larry as Larry K Larry K yeah. um no uh but uh we wanted to talk a little bit about Lawrence Kazan and doing some interviews on why it was important to him to make light and magic and I, I'm obviously gonna start with John on this one. Um, what are, what are your thoughts on what do you his mean? interviews? What is that supposed to yeah. mean? Why, why John? I don't get it. Uh, this is like when we because... were talking about going to what panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because he's in his phone. Oh, you're just going to claim that. <laughs> <laughs> um, my thoughts are, I, I mean, I, I liked what him bring up the fact, which I didn't know that George Lucas had the foresight of saying, we need to capture all of this. I think this will be important one day. And when you're doing things, you're, you're never thinking about like, man, I should really like capture this to like preserve this moment, like a time capsule. I so am. apparently during a lot of productions and stuff, uh, Lucas wanted it documented, you know, without the thought of like, I'm going to make a documentary about this, but he wanted historical archives about what he was doing. And I think that is so incredible. And like, it goes back to what J.W. Rinsler was saying about how when he went to the archives or like the almost the, the, the trash bins and he was like, I couldn't believe all this stuff I found. Like I was able to make these books out of things that they thought was trash. Um, it's uh, it may it means so much to me as a Star Wars fan, because I feel. As more and more time goes on and you see how, you know. The word I hate discourse is online sometimes. It's like people are so like right now and it's almost like they're dismissive of like george lucas's star wars because they think the bad group of fans out there that shall remain nameless like own george lucas because they're using him as like you ruined his star wars it's like no we're gonna take george back to the light side here you don't own him no one owns him he's star Not he's the guy that, who created they hated him like 20 years ago i uh, know and it's that's they're ridiculous they have no nothing to stand on but I, do you understand, like, like, I think there's this, like, weird reaction to those types of fans to then say, well, then we can't align with George Lucas because they have claimed him. And it's just like, no, like, the history of Star Wars is so important. 
and I always say that whole like metaphor I try to create, which is like you got to make sure you have at least one arm still on that tree, which is like in my opinion sort of like what Dave Filoni's been doing, um, based to the basics of what Star Wars is, you know, family, hope, uh, teaching kids right from wrong, those simple fable stories. Uh, that you layer in and make more complicated and add big ac big action to and stuff. But I, I just love the idea of preserving this stuff so I can show my son one day, you know, look how they made this movie back then. This is what they had. They didn't know what they were doing, but he still brought them in because they didn't know what they were doing, because they didn't know that there was a ceiling. They didn't know what was impossible because they didn't know what was possible. And that's so cool to me. And I'll never forget, and I put this in my review of the series, at that panel, Kasdan saying what the biggest reason he made, told the story the way he did was for his grandchildren and inspiring young kids to pick up things and play with things and try to do something you've never done before and see what you come up with and collaborating, sharing, all that stuff. And it's because that stuff exists. So that was my biggest takeaway from him talking about the importance of making this documentary was him talking about the foresight that L Lucas had for a movie that could have been a complete failure. We're forgetting that. This could have, he, he could have it went out. It was to a certain extent. He could have filmed Star Wars? Yeah. It, it, remember? Spielberg watched it and was like, this, this is trash. Oh, right. But once it came out and it was done and they yes, had everything. but I'm it, saying it, at a yeah. certain point, it was somewhat of a failure. They were scared. But yeah. it's okay. You don't learn from succeeding. You learn from failing. Right. So I, I think it's just... It, it, all the hours and stuff that he had them film and document the, the ILM team in LA and him in UK filming the show, filming the movie. I, it's just incredible because it could have just fell on its face, been absolutely nothing. He would have had all this footage, all these camera crews, the budget he put into probably that, and it would have been all for nothing. And the fact that he had the passion to say, I want to capture this because I think I'm onto something here is unbelievable. And I think that the biggest strength to George Lucas as a creator is that he was decades ahead of everybody in every aspect, including the, the process of documenting and observing and archiving this. Uh, I think it's amazing. I'm glad that Kazin like, put his thumb right on that and said, that's it. That's so important. And I like that we now have a new series made in 2022 about the start of all this that we can always show people, always go back to ourselves as a reminder of... Uh, what how this all started and also a big part of like how not serious this was and how silly it was at times and and uh it ilm was really the first rebel alliance and i think that's uh so damn cool and i'm glad kazdin was the one to do it because he, he's an incredible storyteller yeah um what little i have seen of light and magic um i can say that it is pretty incredible to see the uh, faces of lots of names that you've been hearing and mm -hmm. seeing them. And it's not just like a quick interview, but it often feels like they are the players and they keep cutting back to that person again and again and again. And you're like, Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm starting to understand the team here. Um, so it's, it's very good and very important. Uh, if you are, you know, um, I, I, I saw someone today that said that the show was, is the lessons that you learn are, practical in almost anything you do in life is like it's all about like taking shots and just putting together like the right team and working together and a lot, lot of those types of uh just it, general <laughs> motivational things um so yeah i mean uh, obviously very important and very cool that he did have the foresight to record it uh, sometimes people record things and it doesn't <laughs> you know like we documented all of the lone ranger you know, like right. uh, like the movie the, with Johnny Depp and all that. We have like 700 fails. hours yeah. on the making of Battlefield Earth. Yes, exactly. What? Yeah, exactly. What? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Lacey, any thoughts to wrap up Resistance Report on uh, Light and Magic? I know. Um, I'm sad that I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. it, it, like, really bothers me. I love behind-the-scenes stuff, so it is a painful thing. You're going to lose your mind. On top of a already painful week. <laughs> been um but this article was really nice as like kind of like a an appetizer to what i'm gonna see which talks about you know how ilm and lucasfilm in general is, it's all about community it's about people working together and collaboration and working towards a common goal and i think that nowadays that gets lost a lot 
uh, whether it's at work or in, I don't know, any type of aspect like the Star Wars community and stuff, I think working together gets lost sometimes. Um, it gets lost to egos and to um, just like people not being able to to set that aside. And I think that from what I've seen from the trailer, from what I read, read from John's reviews and uh, this article is it, time and time again, it just seemed like the people that were working together didn't have egos. They were like, mm-hmm. okay, we're going to do some cool stuff. We're going to support one another. And when you succeed, we all succeed. And I think that gets lost a lot nowadays. I think it's a, it's a constant hustle. I think it's a, hey, I'm going to get there first. And it's inspiring to see a environment like this where people were encouraged to work together. They wanted to help. Um, I'm someone that always wants to help. That's just who I am as a person. So when I see something like this where it's a creative endeavor and like people are just willing to chime in, um, and I'm going to go back to the Mandalorian panel again because I feel like the most recent example of us seeing something like this is the Mandalorian with Jon Favreau because the whole model thing that they did with the Razor Crest where he talked about how he was like, you know what, I want to make this model. And John Knoll was like, oh, I made this whole ramp for you to use last night. I just did a side project. <laughs> I love you, John Knoll. Um, and then, like, he brought in old guys from the model shop that were like, oh, I still make models in my garage. Let me take a look. And it's just like that really interesting, fun environment of, hey, you're doing something fun. I want to I wanna participate. And I'm not going to ask for anything in return. I just want to be a part of it. And I think a lot yeah. of times that gets lost nowadays where it's, hey, what am I getting out of this? Or, hey, how is this going to help me? And you're not seeing that here. It's very much like high fives all around team. Mm-hmm. Let's go have yeah. a pizza and, and talk and, about our next steps. <laughs> and it's interesting, yeah. too, the dynamic. I'm interested to see where it goes because the first two episodes have been about a bunch of guys who get to hang out and make some space movies where nothing's on the line. And now right. get it into the third episode. They have to hang out and they have to create (laughs) the next big space movies to, you know what I mean? It's like their dynamics are going to change. So it's just interesting, like the the wild west of it at first. And then now it's like a job. So it's cool. Yeah. And I, I definitely am interested to take away some kind of inspiring motivational, uh, pieces of how to not get burnt out and just keep loving what you love. I think that's something that nowadays it's like, oh, you have a side hustle, like make that your job, like do this thing and like get money out of it and Mm -hmm. then like keep doing it for the rest of your life until you die. Whereas I feel like this is something that even when Lawrence Kasdan is talking about in this article, it's, hey, so-and-so made movies when they were 10 years old and then they were working at Lucasfilm and then 50 years later, they're still doing those cool things because they love it so much. So Mm -hmm. I think that there's some stuff that I'm excited to take away on that aspect of like remaining steadfast in why do you, why do you love what you love? And I think that sometimes that gets lost as well. Yep. Um, Well, more stuff that I'm very excited for stuff that I love is actually in our next segment on the show. So I'm going to end resistance report here and hand it back over to Lacey. All right, guys, it's time for the Patreon pod race. So thanks to you guys, we do get to do what we love, which is why we're here. So uh, a way to support us outside of just following us here on YouTube, subscribing, ringing the bell for notifications, following us on Twitter at RBATSWNN or on Instagram at The Resistance Broadcast or any of the audio platforms as well, SoundCloud, Spotify, which we just hit over, I think, 1,000 followers, which is really awesome. Apple Podcasts. We we had 1,000 just this year. We're like Oh, sorry. I said it it wrong. This year, which is crazy. You know, just knowing that people are out there listening is just like such an awesome thing to recognize. (laughs) Um, But if you want to support us outside of that, you want to say, hey, I love what you're doing. I see the passion that you have, and I want to become part of the team, so to speak. Uh, You can head over to patreon.com slash resistance broadcast, starting at just $2 a month. That's it, $2. 
uh, you can join the page and get extra content every week, including our poll chats, um, different types of content like Q and A's, which we just did, which we do like a monthly, like you can ask us anything type uh, scenarios. And it's just really fun. But yeah, so this is the part of the show that we we let our generals and spice runners take part. We ask them a question. They give us their answer. But before we get there, I want to thank those people. Um, And I apologize in advance. I'm still trying to breathe. (laughs) So I might have to take a couple of breaks. But thank you to our generals. Carmelo, John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Paul Olson, Frank Grande, Darth Hurricane, John Trollton, Nick Kratz, Christian Morales, Brian Smith, Matt Chitty, Danny, Mike Ramori, Matt Heath. Chris White, Brendan McLaughlin, Count Pepto, Samuel Zilke, and Val Trichkoff. Thank you guys so much. And to our Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gelnar, Ryan Wara, Dave Hornack, Micah Harrison, Thomas Hennessy, Andrew Staley, and Jeremy Myers. Thank you guys for keeping it spicy as our Spice Runners. Thank you. And this week we have General Frank Grande. What up, Frank? How's it going? Frank is so kind. He's such a nice person. Yeah. Um, so Frank, we asked you, what are your main takeaways from the new Andor trailer and how, or, and has this trailer specifically changed your expectations heading into the series? So Frank, take it away. Hey everyone. So Andor, yeah, I was definitely going to watch this show before, but after watching the new trailer, I'm super hyped. Just from that opening scene of the Star Destroyer descending down on that planet just sets the tone right away that we're in the era where the Empire is just all powerful and unchallenged and the people are just backed into a corner and can't take it anymore. I think we're in for something really great here. Um, and we've always seen characters like Andor and Saul Guerrero being the heroes that will do just about anything they have to to get the job done. But I think we're going to be surprised with some other characters, particularly Mon Mothma. You know, I've always felt that she was just portrayed as the elegant face of the rebellion and then what they want the New Republic to be. But I have this feeling that she's going to have to get her hands dirty and it's going to show a grayer era of Star Wars that we've ever seen before. So I'm really excited for the show. Um, The fact that it's just as long as almost like The Mandalorian, I believe. So we're in for a wild ride. So I hope everyone's doing well and may the force be with you. Nicely done, Frank. You have quite the collection, and I love yeah. it. Uh, John, what did you think? Um, I like what he brought up about the Star Destroyer because those shots made me think of the Star Destroyer in Jetta, like hovering mm-hmm. and mining for the kyber crystals or whatever they were doing. But because it's so, it's still strange seeing a Star Destroyer in atmosphere. Yeah, and in atmosphere. I, I I just think that's so cool and. Um, I mean, you, you do bring up Mon Mothma. I don't think they're hiding that. I mean, I think she and Diego Luna are going to be the two at the forefront of like the marketing campaign mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. I am. I like what you said about getting her hands dirty. This, so I'm interested to see what she does there. So I'm excited that you're excited, man, because I am too. Uh, and we're not too far off. I did, did push it out, but we're right around the corner to, to digesting a lot of this series right out of the gate. So uh, great job as always. And yeah, I, I got to get a closer look at Everything you have back there, it looks like a lot of Marvel. Uh, I want to see what else you have back there. Do you have any like old stuff? Any like old Batman or Superman or anything? Got to take a closer look. Thanks, Frank. James? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> gosh, there's not much to say. I mean, like, there's everything to say. You know, it's like one of those things, like you watch this trailer, I'm all excellent points. The Star Destroyer is huge. Um, you know, sometimes you see uh, a trailer that d- it literally doesn't even matter what else is in the trailer because like the first three shots or whatever already have you like, holy crap, man. And uh, I think this was a uh, really interesting in particular trailer because they 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 have led us to believe that everybody was looking up at the sky to see like some craft f- flying down, caught on fire or something like that. So we're all like, OK, well, I know what all these people are looking at. Right. And then when they actually show the real clip of the, it being like a Star Destroyer up in the sky, I think everybody was taken aback, you know, s- similar to Ray, like, like, you know, moving across the sand. And then you realize there's a Star Destroyer in the background kind of oh, thing. Oh, yeah. And it's just like all of a sudden now we're focused. We're serious. This is a this is a, a, a thing that we need to be paying attention to. Um, so. Yeah, I think uh, all of the stuff, everything about this show, I think is just going to be nailed. We're going to talk about it for like 
12 weeks <laughs> or more, you know, uh, it, it's coming. Thank you. Thank you for doing the pod race. Yeah. Thanks so much, Frank. I agree. I think Mon Mothma is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see all her outfits. I said that before, but I, I stand by. I think she's going to have some of the best costumes in Star Wars. Um, thanks for your support. John, back to you. All right. Uh, we're going to do a uh, combined Ask the Resistance here, where we're all going to mm. sort of quickly tackle this question. So here we go. And the submitter of said question is Keith Miller at K Miller NC. You from North Carolina, Keith? Is that the deal? Hey, Keith. All right. Keith asked, Star Wars does not have as much source material as Marvel, but still has a lot. Would you prefer a new theatrical trilogy based on some kind of source material? If so, what source material? Or would you prefer completely new material? So I will start with Lacey. Welcome back to the show, Lacey. Oh, um, I feel like one of those kids that wasn't paying attention while the teacher was talking. Um, James. Yeah, I, I can do it. I got my answer real quick. <laughs> I, I would say the answer is no for, for me. Um, I don't want them to ha- to base it on any sort of existing Legends material or, or anything like that uh, because I think that it has been sort of a point of pride that recently as I have invested more and more into Star Wars that I can tell people that Star Wars is cool because... If you look at every other big major franchise that's been around, you know, Lord of the Rings, uh, Hunger Games, Harry Potter, uh, like you can name them, like just just keep going. Um, It's always based on some sort of pre-existing book or book series or or movie series or comic series, even all of Marvel, all of DC, all that stuff. It's all based on this stuff. Star Wars feels like it's the most successful franchise that's still around still doing stuff on all original or new material uh not based on anything so i say if nothing more than just that let star wars be what it is all right lacy new star wars trilogy based on some source material or brand new thanks john i did read the question while james (laughs) was answering um (laughs) i would want something completely new i said this actually when in my head, not on the podcast because I wasn't here in yet. In your head. Um, when Lucasfilm Andrew. was purchased by Disney, I thought, oh my gosh, we're going to get new Star Wars. Now, of course, there's a part of me that's like, give me Luke Skywalker, but I just feel like we constantly are going back to those ties of what we already know. Um, and I just want to see something that I've never seen before. And yeah. that's what I long for. I'm kind of in that boat too. I always feel like source material can be dangerous because there's a you're always just immediately creating the precedent but, of hey, this is my thing. You like, didn't that's do it people... the way it's better in the book. You didn't do it that especially right books because book is such a personal medium yeah. that like it you're with your book in bed. You're in your it's, in your house. Yes, like, it, it's how you're seeing it. You're feeling it. You're reacting to it. So I get it. And it, the book is like a very so many experience. times when there's a movie based on a book you always hear everyone say well the book was better it's like all right but i'm never gonna read it so hunger games <laughs> is a really good book um but... hunger games made a book out of the movie i hate you so much right. yeah, they did. yeah thanks they need to make airheads the book <laughs> in fact the author is from newtown connecticut fun fact of airheads no hunger games <laughs> oh maybe i'm the airhead <laughs> good you think all right listen here's the deal that's the end of the show that's me being tony gilroy <laughs> i'm creating a tony gilroy personality and all of his sentences start with here's the deal we're gonna get a phone um, call oh. yeah <laughs> thanks oh yeah I'll bring back the phone call anyway i gotta work on my tony gilroy impression but that is the end of the show so thanks everybody for listening watching being a part of trb like Lacey said subscribe to the show give us a five star rating if if your platform has a rating uh and spread the word because spreading the word is how we do grow so appreciate that make sure you go to star wars news net for all of your star wars news reviews editorials information and more uh johnny hoey on twitter uh writing and editing at star wars news net and my movie podcast just like the movies taking a little break because me and mike are actually going to be hanging out uh well we already did by the time this episode comes out anyway james uh you can find me on twitter and instagram both at myra trunks lacy Oh my God, I'm trying so hard not to cough. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at 
Lacey Gillerin. So I made it, guys. We did it, fam. We're here. Yes. Yes. Welcome back. <laughs> uh, we'll be back on Thursday where we're going to really have a lengthy conversation all about the Andor trailer and do some speculating, have a good time. So enjoy your weeks, and we'll see you Thursday right here on the Resistance Broadcast. See you around, kids. Bye.